Hey, what's up, everybody? We have the honor of speaking with uh, Dr. Cameron Marshall today. He's a doctor of chiropractic, uh, a sports injury specialist, and founder of Complete Concussions Management. Uh, they've, they've come from very small beginnings and grown to over 400 clinics wide. We're going to be talking about all things concussion today, pretty much everything we have time to discuss, we're going to discuss. Um, Dr. Marshall, do you want to just kind of take it away from your introduction and, and give us a little bit about your background, uh, elaborating on any of those titles for us? Uh, sure. Yeah, I did uh, my undergraduate degree at Western University in kinesiology. And um, actually, and this is kind of how I got into sports injuries is that I was, um, when, when you get into your fourth year program, they pair you with the sports team and I was with the men's hockey team. And so I was doing all their injury coverage and stuff like that at the sporting events. And so I was thinking, you know, AT, PT, Cairo, you know, kind of yeah. around that thing. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, Cairo was interesting to me just because it was like a lot of hands on. I really liked the idea of, of of, you know, just getting in there and cracking joints and things like that. It just seemed like a cool thing to do. And, and a couple of the guys on the team had dads who were chiropractors. And so I would just, you know, talk to them, hang out with them, things like that. And so I thought it was kind of cool. So I went to chiropractic college and uh, did my four years there, got my doctor of chiropractic degree. And then after there's like a postgraduate residency program where you can specialize in various things um, mm -hmm. from radiology, orthopedics, that type of thing. And so I specialized in, uh, in sports. So that was another, an additional two years mm -hmm. in that. And then with that, you have to do research in something. And uh, I was actually looking at like studying balance and skating speed and hockey players and all these different kind of biomechanical type things that I had in mind. And um, a really famous hockey player from Canada, Sidney Crosby, for those that know, uh, mm -hmm. got a concussion and he was out. And, you know, we had always thought that, well, concussions are these short term things, but he was taking months and months and months and months to get better. And, and actually, one of my supervisors said, why don't you look into concussion? Something's going on here. And uh, actually, at the time, Crosby was getting treated by a chiropractor in the United States um, who does like the functional neurology type stuff. So I started looking into that. Not really much evidence on the functional neurology side of things. And so I kind of left that. But there was a lot of evidence showing that concussion is a treatable injury. It can actually be rehabbed uh, and all of these things. And I kind of just dove into this rabbit hole. And um, that actually kind of led me to the University of Buffalo. They were studying exercise. But they had kind of keyed on to the idea that some of these patients are also cervicogenic, meaning that they have symptoms coming from their cervical spine. And I was like, that's interesting. So I, you know, knowing from the whiplash literature, I'm like, this can cause visual dysfunction. This can, ca this can cause dizziness. This can cause headaches. And uh, so I just kind of went down that rabbit hole and I reached out to John Letty, uh, who's a really famous concussion researcher. Um, and uh, I don't know if you ever heard of the Buffalo concussion treadmill test, but he's there. Yeah, the absolutely. They're, they're, the, they're the developers of that. Nice. And um, so I reached out and said that I'm interested in studying, you know, this. And uh, he was like, okay, let's do it. So I ended up doing my, my fellowship, uh, all of my research kind of in conjunction with the University of Buffalo and John Letty. Um, and basically after immersing myself in the research for, you know, two and a half, three years, I'm realizing that there's a huge problem with, you know, concussion and how they're being managed. Right. And, the, and it all comes down to education. And, um, you know, so that was the idea behind complete concussion management was starting and creating a standardized concussion management program for more for amateur athletes to try and give them the same kind of, you know, benefits that a professional would have where you would actually have, you know, really good quality baselines, not just doing, you know, computerized neurocognitive testing, but actually doing balance reaction time, uh, some elements of the scat we're doing, you know, ocular motor tracking and things like that. So we're doing additional testing, all stuff that's been, you know, shown to be more reliable, but mm -hmm. now all the clinics know how to do it. They all follow the same procedure for return to sport. They all follow the same procedure for, for um, return to work and learn and that type of thing. And so the idea of having that standardized protocol was, okay, well now we got to start teaching these people and are people going to, you know, what's the model of this and everything like that. And so basically I'd like, I was, I was, I was, we were, we were just chatting before I came on, but the, like we started with four clinics um, yeah. and then we've gradually just kept growing uh, up in there. So that's, that's the, the long story of, of, wow. you know, my, my background, I guess. And so we're still doing that. Um, and we're kind of growing every day and we're teaching people from all over the world. Now we got people in, you know, Sweden and Norway and, you know, Australia, New Zealand. So it's, uh, it's pretty cool.
That's so cool. And, and I, you know, we talked about this a little bit earlier. I'll, I'll repeat this. Um, you know, I reached out to you because obviously you have a lot of experience treating individuals with concussion, you know, post concussion, concussive syndrome, athletes and the like. But another thing that you've done is, is, and so I think you're, you're definitely an expert to speak on that topic. So I want to learn a lot from you and I want our audiences to learn a lot from you. Uh, but also you've made some significant efforts to raise awareness uh, and your educational tools that you've presented are, are absolutely phenomenal. And so just a big thanks from me um, for being able to put this out for individuals so they can learn um, a little bit more about what this is. So, so maybe we can just start just, just really baseline information. Can you break down for us in a really digestible way. What is a concussion? And then maybe we can just go into what is post-concussive syndrome? Um, I'm actually working on a presentation right now for this. I'm giving a, I'm giving a talk next week uh, for actually the Sports Cairo College. Uh, we're doing a virtual concussion seminar. So I'm doing cool. a topic on this. And send, me, send me the link. Send me the yeah. link. Uh, yeah, okay. Afterward. Um, yeah, afterward. Yeah, afterward. And um, so my actual coverage is, is, is what is post-concussion syndrome and, and kind of what, why is it there? Why do people have persistent symptoms? And so mm -hmm. essentially what a concussion is, is um, acceleration and deceleration of the brain. So a lot of people think that concussion creates, you know, damage to the brain. And we, we really don't have any good evidence that concussion creates damage to the brain. There's theories that maybe it's damaging brain cells at a kind of what they call a microstructural level. So beyond mm -hmm. what, you know, our normal imaging might be able to see. Because if you see a concussion injury on an MRI or a CT scan, you actually can't see it. It looks normal. The, the, the scans look normal because those types of images look at the structure of the brain. And a concussion is actually um, a, what, what's called a functional injury. So it changes how the brain functions, um, but you can't necessarily see that with any type of imaging. So it's kind of an invisible injury, both, you know, kind of metaphorically where people look somewhat normal uh, for the most part. And also, you know, actually, because you can't necessarily pick it up on any image. We have no validated diagnostic tests for concussion whatsoever. It's purely a clinical diagnosis. And it's based on the symptoms that somebody may experience or the signs that you might see after somebody, you know, were to take some sort of significant impact. So okay. it's acceleration, deceleration of the brain. And essentially okay. what happens is if the brain cells get, ex get stretched to a, to a great enough degree, what you actually get is for those that understand physiology is you're going to get the membrane of that neuron to deform a little bit. And that membrane on the neuron is actually porous. Like we think of it like a long tube kind of thing, but it's actually a porous structure. So as you stretch it, those little pores will actually open up. And mm. if it opens up enough, you're going to get ion exchange. You're going to get the ions from inside that neuron leaking out. And you're going to get the ions from outside coming in. And so what that does is it creates depolarization, right? For those that remember kind of intro physiology is you have high levels of potassium inside the cell. You have high levels of sodium and calcium on the outside. Mm. When those switch, mm. you get, you basically get an action, an, an, an action potential that neuron will fire. So if you think about a concussion, think about millions of brain cells all at the same time, all getting stretched. Mm -hmm. all going on, on undergoing depolarization at the exact same time. And what happens is just chaos, right? Mm -hmm. So your brain cells are firing in a haphazard way in this chaotic way that doesn't make any sense. And so you may lose balance. You may lose consciousness. You may, uh, you're, you may lose vision. Uh, you may have a ringing in the ears. You may be seeing stars. You're not seeing stars. You're just seeing random discharge of, you know, those, those neurons kind of within your visual fields that are yeah. making you feel like you're seeing stars. And it's all because of this stretch response. Well, brain stretches, it comes back together. Like it's over, right? The brain came back, it looks normal, everything's normal, but it's still firing on the inside. Yeah. So that, that firing, that, that kind of excitatory phase, they call it, then mm -hmm. what, what happens over the next few days is that you just burn a lot of energy because um, there's other bio biochemical things that happen that I don't necessarily need to get into. But essentially what happens is you start burning energy. Yeah. And, um, and then you kind of hit kind of your low end energy after a week so, and then gradually restore that back up. So that's the concussion. It's basically an excitatory stimulation of the brain that results in an energy deficit within the cells of the brain. So during that period of time, they're not functioning well. Um, you're feeling very fatigued, foggy, maybe, maybe having more headaches, things like that. And then over the next few weeks, as that, as that kind of recovers back up to baseline normal levels, most people will start to feel better. Post-concussion syndrome are the patients. It's now known as persistent concussion symptoms. Uh, the acronym stays the same as PCS. But people that have persistent concussion symptoms are those that still experience symptoms beyond that four-week period. So 
right after you hit that four week period, if you're still having symptoms, now you're in the bucket of persistent concussion symptoms. And since that energy level recovers in three to four weeks, well, why are people still having symptoms, right? From a pathophysiologic perspective, concussion is a short term thing. Um, people just really get angry at me when I say that on social media uh, because they're like, I've been suffering for three years. Like, yeah, yeah. and you're yeah, going, yeah. I, I, I know that, but from a pathophysiologic perspective, like that heals, right? That's yeah. like saying, you know, I had a fracture in my wrist, right? Uh -huh. The fracture itself is healed, but I still have pain in my wrist. Right. So what's the, what's the pain from? Well, the, it's not sure. the fracture. It's the other dysfunctions that have been created because mm. of the fracture. Mm. Right. So can you treat that? Yeah, probably. If you figured out what was going on, you could probably do some stuff to, to, to fix that or treat that. Right. Whether it be mm. surgical or, you know, or, or non. So it's kind mm. of the same idea. So, so post-concussion syndrome is that persistent symptoms that <laughs> kind of linger um, as a result of the injury itself. Mm, yeah, that's interesting. And it's also, there's an interesting parallel there, which you and I are going to have to try to not get too nerdy in one direction, otherwise we're going to lose our audiences. But I'll bring this up and then we, we won't stay here long. But there's an interesting parallel between chronic pain, uh, which, you know, we've got a lot of evidence now that's pointing more towards the nervous system, hypersensitivity, um, changing of, of, of afferent responses. Um, but, you know, there's an interesting parallel between that and what you're describing as post-concussive or persistent concussive symptoms. Um, thank you for that correction, by the way. Um, where we're still pointing, we've got the nervous system involved, obviously, but for some reason, whatever happened, happened and went through the process of, I'll use the word healing, perhaps it's not the most appropriate term, but we went through that acute phase, mm -hmm. much like we might go through an acute phase of low back pain, but whatever happens, happens, but yet here we are a year later and maybe your pain's even worse. Or in this mm -hmm. case, maybe the acute phase was bad, but maybe it's gotten even worse as it's become persistent. Um, so, so it's interesting that we're still pointing to the nervous system with both of those circumstances. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think there's that. I think there's, um, um, there's, you know, there's kind of that central desensitization type mm -hmm. phenomenon, if you want to call mm -hmm. it that. And, um, you know, that kind of hypersensitivity, people might still yeah. have light sensitivity, noise mm -hmm. sensitivity. Um, you know, they may have, um, increased pain responses. And actually this has been studied in patients with persistent concussion symptoms that they do actually have increased pain responses. And so it does show that there's potentially that there now, is this inflammatory? Is this a maladaptive response? Is this, um, you know, psychosomatically generated where, where you have a lot of, you know, overlaying anxiety and depression and PTSD where patients with ongoing symptoms start thinking, Oh my God, am I going to be like this forever? And yeah. that alone and the fear of the unknown and no one really to help guide you can, you know, manifest itself in that way too. stress response, Absolutely. a whole bunch of things. Right. So yeah. um, I think that, that, uh, that, yeah, there's, there's a huge corollary there. Um, cause it's I, on, on the idea of chronic pain, it's the same kind of thing, right? Yeah. It's all, all these things factor in, right? Which one yeah. thing is it? I don't know. You yeah. have to treat, you have to treat the whole individual. And yeah, absolutely. I really, yeah, I really appreciate your comments about the fear and the uncertainty too. That's such a huge factor in, in, uh, management of almost every condition we could probably think of. Um, so, so, you know, I'm wondering, you, you mentioned that this is one of those, um, you know, one of those injuries where we, we don't necessarily have, we're not able to see it very well in an image, right? It's, it's based on a clinical exam. It's based on, you know, how your physiology is responding to certain stressors. Um, I wonder what the, the implications there are for an athlete who, uh, you know, they have this, you know, insult to the brain and, you know, they've gone through this acute phase and they're still experiencing these symptoms, yet there's nothing... There's nothing really showing. They're not walking around with a, you know, an air cast on. They're not walking around with a sling where you can actually physically see that there's something going on. And it almost seems like there's this, this psychology, there's this guilt there that exists for certain people that basically just think, well, there's probably nothing wrong with me. It's all in my head. Um, or maybe their friends think, oh, he's not really injured. He just wants more time off of practice, this and that. Do you see any, any implications there for individuals to have to sort of suffer in silence because of this? Yeah, I mean, I think we we see that with you know underreporting. We see right. that. Um, I mean, there's research all the time that that's looking at like high school and college athletes and why some may underreport. And uh, there was actually mm -hmm. just uh, a paper that came out the other day and it was looking at you know it did it did kind of like a a survey as to why people might not uh, report. And then it and then it linked all of the uh, all of the. Uh, sorry, I have my my real estate agent here calling. Of course. I'll have to. 
hopefully that's not a rush. Um, <laughs> but um, <laughs> put an offer on a place today. So it's like, hey, um, any, yeah. Business, anyway, business um, or, or home? Business or home? Home, home. Oh, yeah. good for you. Home, Congratulations. Home. Yeah. So we'll see it. We'll see how it goes. But um, um, yeah, so part of the reason why people don't report is that they are getting that pressure both from their peers, yeah. from their coaches, whatever. And so we've always been wondering, well, like, how do we, how do we increase reporting? And for the most part, the idea was, well, let's just educate. Let's just tell the players that, you know, this is why you want to report. This is like what the dangers are. And, but college and high school athletes, you know, especially kind of males, they always seem they're invincible anyway. This is why there's, yeah. you know, drinking and driving and, you know, fights and, and, and all sorts of crazy speed and car accidents and things at that age. It's, they all think they're invincible. So teaching them what the symptoms are is not really what it is. And it comes down to this idea of like the culture of sport, right? If the coaches are telling you to suck it up and if your peers are, are telling you to suck it up or whatever, you may be more likely to, to try and hide the fact you've got an injury. There's this heroic yeah. mentality too, where you're like, you know, I'm going to be there, do or die for my team, you know, like, yep. like going into battle and yep. people aren't really considering that it's, it's, it's just a game and there'll be more next week. And um, so I think that that weighs in heavily for sure. Yeah, definitely. You know, uh, moving on a little bit. Um, this is one of my favorite things to do is, is a bit of a, maybe a myth busters section. You know, let, let's talk about some of the, the common myths surrounding concussion. Now we could, we could go, feel free to take this from a, an athlete, coach, trainer, PT, take it from whatever perspective you want. Um, just, just give us some of the common misunderstandings out there or maybe misinformation, any of the above. Um, I think the miss understanding um from most people is that um when your symptoms go away that that means you're you're recovered and if you know the only time you shouldn't be playing is if you have symptoms right mm -hmm. um and that's that's actually false um mm -hmm. you know it's, it's kind of like your doctor telling you to keep taking the antibiotics even if you start feeling better mm -hmm. right because the, the infection is still there and you got to kind of keep uh -huh. keep doing it so that's a okay. big thing um you know that's a that's a good comparison that we always use um, more so can I pause more. you there? Can I pause you there for yeah. just a second? Just yeah. so I can learn a little more from you. So, so the idea that when symptoms subside, we shouldn't go back to play. That sounds like a huge wall you're going to hit in front of coaches. Can you talk to me a little bit more about that? And then maybe what your thoughts are on wins? Are we, are we needing to do some, some baseline testing to return to play in addition to symptoms being gone? Fill in that gap for me. So uh, concussion causes, you know, signs and symptoms that happen early. That's a very kind of short duration piece. Then you get that drop in energy, but yeah. generally that like you hit your peak low around, you know, that seven day mark. Well, that's huh. usually when people start feeling better symptomatically. And so we know that there's actually no correlation between that energy deficit and the symptoms that people experience. And huh. We know also from the research that it's that energy deficit that matters in terms mm -hmm. of the cumulative effect of concussions in terms of a thing called second impact syndrome. So if you had a concussion and you get another one too close together, you can actually die from that yeah. and at the very least create permanent damage. And the reason is because yeah. let's say your energy levels drop and we know that like in mild brain injury, which is concussion, your energies drop by about 20%. So your ATP levels in those brain cells fall by about 20%. Mm -hmm. In in severe brain injury, which is like you're in a coma and you know very close to death, um, your your ATP levels are about 50% of what they normally are. So it's the same kind of thing. But those once you get down to that level, though that ATP level there is actually not sustainable, and those brain cells will actually start dying off. Right? They'll start going mm -hmm. un undergoing apoptosis and actually dying off, creating permanent neurological damage. Whereas concussion, you're not hitting that threshold. You create a temporary little dysfunction, it comes back up and everything's good. And you know, everything, all those connections are still intact. There may be some functional issues that you got to kind of work out with rehab and stuff. But for the most part, that's easy to do because the, those neural connections are somewhat still there. When you get down to this level, you're actually, you're actually creating like widespread damage. Okay. If you get a concussion, you drop down by that 20%. If you were to come back up to that normal, you get another concussion, you again, just drop by 20%. But if you get a concussion drop by that 20% and then get another concussion right there, same force, same type of injury. Now you drop down to the level of severe brain injury. We're actually about 50% lower. 
and then you start actually creating permanent damage. The recovery time now goes from, you know, uh, three to four weeks for that energy level to get back up, up to three to four months. So between 90 and 120 days is now wow. the recovery of that ATP low. So mm -hmm. now, so the, the, so they call this the window of vulnerability. So it's okay. kind of that, that three to four weeks when that energy is low and on its way back up, if you get hit in that time, the thought is anyway, we haven't actually proven this, but the thought is that you can get concussed easier. And if you do get another concussion, that concussion will kind of compound and create a cumulative injury, which could be fatal. Um, and that's really the big thing. Now, symptoms tend to go away in that, you know, that first week, but you still okay. have another two or three weeks of potential vulnerability. Okay. So the way to look at this and everyone's kind of different, right? We don't necessarily have a blueprint to say, you know, everybody should be out for, for four weeks. And I think you would run into an even bigger wall there, right? We have a hard enough time having people report injuries when we tell them that they might be out for a week, right? Mm -hmm. Try telling the NFL that you got to sit your players yeah, yeah. for, for <laughs> yeah. four weeks every time a concussion happens. It's the right thing to do probably, yeah. right? If, if you're yeah. dealing with this CTE crisis, yeah. but yeah. they're just going to go, well, no, we're just going to do our own return to play and they'll be better when they're better. So that's where the idea of behind function comes in. Well, okay, if you want to test when they're better, how are you going to do that? You sure. need to find tests that correlate with that recovery in, 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 the, in the brain. So what tests will do that? Well, if you look at something like a SCAT, which most people do, oh, we do baseline SCAT testing. Okay. So the SCAT, even if you have a baseline, those values tend to normalize three to four days after injury. Okay. So even before your symptoms go away, so mm -hmm. symptoms tend to come back about seven to 10 days. SCAT, like if you look at the best test, which is a balance test, if you look at kind of some of those memory tests and, and, and um, the, um, the um, numbers in reverse, like the, the, the um, what's the category? Concentration tests. Um, those tests will actually normalize back to baseline levels within three days of injury. Okay. So useless for return yeah. to play, but yeah, yeah. really, really good for sideline, right? We know okay. that adding that to our sideline assessment, if we're unsure, mm -hmm. right? If you're, if, if you're basically sure the guy gets hit and he comes off the field like this and uh, you know, he's slurring his speech, you don't have to do a scat. You already know he's concussed yeah. and that's it. He's done. Yeah. But if it's kind of hit and miss and they're not reporting any symptoms, but you think that was a big hit, you might be able mm -hmm. to pick something up with a scat. So having that test is maybe good for diagnosis. Okay. But then when you get into now return to sport, you need better tests than that right? You need okay. to be looking at how are their eyes moving? You need to be looking at, you know, more in-depth cognitive function. You need to be looking at better balance testing. We use force plates, for example, looking at postural sway in a bunch of different ways. So you're actually looking at what their center of mass looks like pre-injury, post-injury. And you can't use normative data because the range of normal, right, is so wide that, you know, if you have somebody that normally has exceptional balance and they come in after a concussion and they're, they're average now, well, that's not recovered for them, right? Mm -hmm. They may be an average compared to the population, but they're supposed to be exceptional. But I don't have no way of knowing that they're supposed to be exceptional unless I've tested them before and know that they know yeah. they have exceptional balance. Yeah. So that's the whole yeah. idea behind having a baseline so that sure. it's not necessarily to make your diagnosis, which a lot of people think it is. For the most part, mm -hmm. you don't need it. All mm -hmm. you need to be like, if somebody gets hit, they have symptoms, which most people will say, mm -hmm. that's it. The diagnosis yeah. is made, okay? Yeah. If yeah. they want to hide it from you, you're probably going to miss it anyway. You won't even know to test that person because they're not going to report to you. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, if yeah. they report to you, you've already nailed it. So you don't necessarily need it for the diagnosis. It's now the symptoms have gone away. Okay, great. That's step one. Now let's start exercising you. So we put them on the treadmill. We start ramping up their physical exertion. How does that make you feel? Oh, I'm starting to get a little bit dizzy. Okay. You're not ready yet. Good. Yeah. You're, you're asymptomatic at rest, but once we start getting you going, okay. Now they pass that, let's say. They have no mm -hmm. symptoms when we get them up to full exertion. Now mm -hmm. let's put you into non-contact practice, start you having a dynamic thing. Now you're moving around. Okay. You're, you're good there. Then we bring them back and we run them through a really, really intense physical exertion test. And it's actually, we got it from the Chicago Blackhawks um, team. Mm -hmm. So okay. it's something that they do with their players. We do it on all okay. of our patients. We've okay. modified it for younger kids, but it's the same type of test. It's very, very difficult exertion. Okay. Then we take you and then we run you through all of those baseline retests again to try and see, are your eyes back to where they were? Is, 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 is your reaction time as fast as it was? Is your balance okay. as good as it was? All of these things. So that okay. now we can say, okay, you're asymptomatic at rest. You're asymptomatic with exertion. You're asymptomatic with practice. You're asymptomatic with a more dynamic, very intense physical exertion test. We basically uh -huh. pushed, pushed you to the limits yeah. and you haven't had any symptoms. And then in that exerted state, we've also tested. Oh, I think I lost your audio. Sorry. I just, I just lost you all of a sudden. Hello. Hello. 
Hello, hello. Uh oh, hang on. Did your uh, did your head uh, AirPod die? There, there we go. Go ahead. Maybe maybe just my headphones. My apologies. Yeah, no worries. So in that exerted state, because usually what we found is that that's actually more sensitive. Is people people tend not to do as well when you have when you test them in an exerted state. Uh -huh. um, so in that exerted state, we run them through all that testing again, and if they're then like showing that functionally they're back to normal then we'll go and make that decision. Right. But they might be asymptomatic for two weeks before that happens, but yeah. that's the, but that's the right way to do it. Okay. And in that case, you're really just trying to provoke symptoms more so than to see what the drop in their balance is. Once you put them through something that's physically exerted, this is really just, we're trying to provoke symptoms. We're trying to provoke symptoms early on. Cause then it, it yeah. kind of prevents us from having to do all that testing. Sure. Right? If I'm, if I'm running somebody through the Blackhawks test, and they're like, oh, I'm so dizzy right now. Yeah. That's it. Test yeah. is over. I don't have to run you through balance and everything else because I know that I'm not going to clear you right now. Yeah. Right. Now we wait a few days and you come back and you try it again. Yeah. If you, if you pass it, then the final little piece I throw into the mix is, all right, now let's test your balance. Now let's test your reaction. I'm looking for any subtle deficits that are still there. If you don't have any, I'm confident that you're kind of at that functional recovery point. Um, and if you, you know, all your balance is a little bit off, you know, then you go, okay, well, let's just wait it out. You know, there's still some issues here that I just, you know, will be a little bit more cautious. Right. So that's the right approach. That's the approach that we should be taking with every athlete, particularly those in the amateur level, because they're affected a lot more, um, you know, from, from these injuries. And so making sure that they have a safe return to play is super, okay. super, super important. So that's okay. why we, that's, and that's the whole idea behind complete concussion management too, is to have clinics that do this uh -huh. everywhere that wow. know what they're doing, why they're doing it. And then they're all using the same tests so that if you're in, you know, Utah and you travel to California for some sort of tournament, there's somebody there that you can see that's going to run the same testing on the same equipment. Okay. Well, and it, so it sounds like we have a dual thing that we're looking at here. One is you're sounding, sounding like it's just time it is almost like no matter what our testing is showing, it sounds like, and tell me if, um, if I'm hearing this incorrectly, that you're suggesting that time has to be there as a standalone factor, meaning we have to have, I don't know, 30 days go by, no matter what you show us, 30 days has to go by before we're going to clear you for sport. In addition to that 30 days, you need to pass our symptom provoking tests in order to be cleared. So we have to meet both. So if in two weeks, all the testing is asymptomatic, everything that we're doing, we can't provoke symptoms at all. It doesn't matter. We still have to go to that 30 day mark. Is that what you're, is that the suggestion? Well, I mean, you know. that's, that's the thing that I wrestle with. Um, it depends on who, you're, it actually depends on who you're talking to. So okay. if I'm talking to clinicians and we're talking about, you know, managing athletes um, in terms of return to sport, I'm going to tell those clinicians that I want you getting as close to that three to four week mark before you are even putting them through the Blackhawks test. Okay. Right. And this all comes down to patient management and time management so that you're not bringing somebody in and like, okay, I'll see you today, tomorrow, the next day, the next day, the next day, the next day, because you're going to run through your stages way too quickly. And then you're going to yeah. be in a position where you have to make a clearance decision, yeah. you know, at day 10. Yeah. You should never be in that position. You should say, okay, I'll see you today. And then I want you now just kind of gradually working back to school and I'll book you in next week. And that's when we'll do your exertion test if you're ready for it. Okay. Then they do that. Then the following week. Okay. Now we'll book you in for the next. So you're spreading your time out to try and basically make it take at least three weeks before you're even in a position to make that clearance decision. Yeah. Now, if I'm talking to athletes, coaches, parents, anybody else, I'm going to say, yeah, it just takes as long as it takes. You'll be better when you're better. Sometimes it's a week. Sometimes it's three or four. Sometimes it's whatever. Uh -huh. And the reason behind saying that, and the reason why I kind of, I don't want to say lie, but I want to, I, I, I withhold, <laughs> I withhold the truth that I'm actually trying to get you to three or four weeks is because I don't want that patient out of their own best interest. And this is not my own selfish interest. This is, I don't want that patient to say four weeks you know, that doctor down there is clearing guys in exactly. five days. Exactly. exactly. I'm going over, I'm going over yeah. there. Right. And now yeah. you start this doctor shopping yeah. trend yep. and they're going to, they're going to somebody that's obviously less qualified that doesn't understand this as well as you do. So yeah. you have to, you have to kind of bridge that gap. So if I'm talking to clinicians, I say, you shouldn't even be in a position to run a Blackhawks unless it's day 21 at least. Mm -hmm. Right. And then at least you've covered your bases. If something were to happen, you say, look, I've done I've done over and above what the standard of care is. 
They were asymptomatic. I put them through this. I put them through that. I put them through this. They were asymptomatic through all that stuff. I tested them here. I tested them here. Here's the results. They're back to normal. And I yeah. gave them the benefit of this window. Yeah. And, and then there you go. Yeah. But you can't, you can't say that to a football coach that, oh, come with me, use our concussion program. You're going to be out for four weeks <laughs> every yeah. time a concussion happens. And they're like, no, like, we're not going to, we're not going to yeah. do that. So it's, it's, yeah. it's this fine balance between like what is in the best interest of the athletes, whether they know it or not, um, is, is taking your time with it. So you kind of, it's a challenging thing to try and explain, but. Well, and I, and I think that uh, your, your comment about doctor shopping or this person got cleared in two weeks, you know, that, that's, a very, that's a very big part of the reality of that discussion. I think another one that may be even more difficult is, you know, you brought up second impact syndrome. And, you know, when you hear a, a term like that and you look at the severity of what's being proposed, in, 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 I mean, you're looking at a significantly higher risk of death. I mean, that's, you know, that's a very big statement to make. But I think the hard part is that when you look in the literature, um, it sounds like there's still some disagreement uh, among certain author groups about, you know, what, what is the exact reality of second impact syndrome? You know, is that risk of death what we think it is? I think that's what makes it hard because then we're having this debate about, well, these authors say this, this one says that, and we try to look at study methodology and we can really pick which one we like more based on, yeah. you know, based on the methods that we think are a little bit better. That makes it, that makes the discussion harder. What are your thoughts on that? Do you run into that debate at all or that argument at all? You run, you only run into that argument with people that know the literature, right? Yeah. And, and most, you know, the, most parents, coaches, you know, healthcare professionals, they have no idea what the extent of that literature is, right? Mm. Um, and so really, I mean, for those that, for those that don't know, I'll, I'll kind of explain it, but basically you have something that's Please, yeah. super, 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 super rare, right? Like it's very, very rare. Uh, I think there's, you know, probably 20 to 30 reported cases of this that are actually published in the literature. And they're, and they're just cases, right? So you have this series of cases that have happened and they all have varying time points. And some of them, you know, we don't really have a reported first concussion, but there's, it was suspected, um, you know, and then all of a sudden now we have this fatal event. So the debate then becomes, well, was it two concussions or was it just a really bad hit? that you know this just was was that was the fatal blow nothing to do with the previous concussion maybe it was just a really big hit and so then you get into that debate now the other debate is around definition now second impact syndrome is defined as you know a fatal outcome but when you look at some of the literature that's been done in mice where they actually deliver these secondary blows, because in humans, you have to just wait for this to happen. Obviously you can't just take people and be like, Hey, do you want to potentially sure. have a fatal outcome? Like sure. you can't do that right ethically. So, but with animal studies, we can do that. And so a lot of these animal studies will look at, okay, if we were to hit a mouse, given the equivalent of a concussion, you know, on this day, and, and then watch to see what that metabolic recovery looks like in a mouse, um, mm. which you can do that in a mouse because you actually have to kill the animal to know like how much ATP deficit there is. Like you have to process the tissue. So obviously not something that we can do in humans. We can't necessarily just look at the ATP level. <laughs> so, but in mice, you can kind of do that. So in mice, um, it's like a five day process. Okay. If they were to hit that mice, uh, that mouse on day five, they show that there's no significant difference between those two, those two hits. So meaning mm -hmm. that if you get a concussion and you fully recover to that five day point, you get another concussion, there's no kind of additive or cumulative effect. Mm -hmm. But when you hit them on day three, they have the equivalent of a severe traumatic brain injury and mm -hmm. some of the animals actually start to die. So if you look at that, they'll, so there was one study that was done by this, this group in Italy that's done a lot of this metabolic work, but so they have a group of control mice. Then they have a group that was hit just once. Then they have a group that had a severe brain injury. And that's where I got that 80%, 50% type of deal. So 80% is a, is a mild traumatic brain injury. And if you're at 50% of your levels, you had a severe traumatic brain injury. Mm -hmm. if, if you waited the full five days and gave them another concussion, they were, they were at the same level. They just basically looked like a single mild traumatic brain injury. If you only waited to day three and gave them the, the equivalent blow, they were now the same, no significant difference between a severe brain injury. And then 10% of the animals in the two concussion group died. 10% of the animals in the severe brain injury group died. So you're basically causing, you're not necessarily causing death 100% of the time, right? You may just end up with a really, really bad injury 
if you were to get hit there. But the definition of second impact syndrome is still kind of based on that fatal outcome. So maybe what we need to do, because that kind of shows that it's not just a big secondary blow. That shows that it's the equivalent force of a concussion causing an additive and cumulative effect that drops that ATP levels down to the levels of serious brain injury. Mm. So to me, that kind of puts that debate to bed. Um, mm. I mean, in an animal way, they've done this in humans too. There's a technology called magnetic resonance spectroscopy. So it's one of these functional imaging techniques, but what it looks at is metabolites in tissue. Mm. And the one that's most interesting in the concussion world is a compound called NAA or N-acetyl aspartate. So this is kind of an, uh, this is, this is an MRI technology. You can look at the levels of different compounds in the brain. NAA okay. has been highly correlated with ATP levels. Okay. So if we can find out what the NAA levels are, we can have a pretty good understanding of what the ATP levels are. Okay. So in humans, when they do this, it's not five days, it's somewhere between 22 and 30. So that's that three to four week mark. Okay. They've had case studies of people that have been involved in this research where they're looking at how long do these levels stay low, and they've okay. actually gotten a second concussion while they were in the study. They weren't supposed to be going back and playing their sport, but they decided to anyway. All of them okay. were asymptomatic at the point they got hit, but then this is what I mean when their ATP levels now took between 90 and 120 days to get back to normal. So that okay. tells us that even though we may not be hitting a fatal outcome every single time we have, but what about 10% of the time we're hitting that okay. fatal outcome? The other 90%, maybe we're just having an additive and cumulative effect that's creating a lot of dysfunction, potentially permanent damage, potentially long-term outcomes, yeah. um, et cetera. I still think that should be viewed as second impact syndrome. Okay. Okay. Well, and, and you, you <laughs> thank you for that. No, thank you for that education. You, you've given me a little bit. I didn't know that, uh, there had to be a death um, in order to call it second impact. I, I was under the understanding you could have just a, a severe traumatic brain injury, um, maybe even resulting in paralysis, but it didn't need to be a death to be called that. So that was education for me. So thank I you think, for that. I, I mean, I think that um, like the definition that, that most people go by is, is the death thing, but I, I think people are well, on talking same. about risk of death, right? I mean, that's the whole yeah, I think, I, 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 so. I, think I think people are on to the same thought process as, as I am as, as calling yeah. somebody that has a severe outcome because yeah. of two back to back. Like, I think we should be changing the terminology on that. Yeah. Um, so. yeah. And there was a push and you, you might, you, you probably know this better than I, I can't recall, but I, I did see this a while ago. There was a push from um, JAMA to basically revise some statements that were made to include more language about second impact syndrome um, that was a pretty big call to arms. I, I can't remember the details of that. Maybe, maybe you're familiar. Um, I, I won't take the time to look it up, but it, it, it does sound like there's a little bit of a push um, to appreciate this second impact syndrome a little bit more seriously um, than we're doing right now. Not allowing this debate to just keep going back and forth so much, but be a little bit more aggressive with the nomenclature. Would you say that's that's correct? Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. I mean, um, and that I I, I, mean, I can't recall that exact reference, but I mean, I probably yeah. read it because you know, yeah. just, this is all I do. So um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I probably jammer, read it so, and said, yeah. I probably read yeah. it and said, yeah, you're right. That's, <laughs> that's absolutely true. I completely agree. Okay, cool. Um, okay. So we were, we we're kind of in the myths, any other mistakes uh, that people make when they're going through concussion that you want to, that you want to speak about? Or do you feel like we've, we've covered that topic pretty well? Um, any other myths? I mean, um, you know, or mistakes, fact, whatever. Yeah. I mean, other ones are the fact that like one concussion causes, you know, permanent damage. I think we've kind of covered that. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. you know, um, yeah, that, I think that's probably, those are the big ones. Okay. You know, what are your thoughts on, you mentioned all these different things can, can be affected. I mean, we're looking at the brain as a master gland here, a master organ, and, and, and there's so much physiology that can be impacted. What about things like, uh, anxiety, depression, uh, you know, in, in severe cases, suicide, emotional dysregulation in addition to physiology. So maybe I'm not dizzy, but maybe I'm having a really significant change in my emotional status. Um, is that something that we should have? Uh, should we, we should be aware of this in athletes and, and individuals? Is it, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's, uh -huh. there's, there's a really high correlation between concussion and anxiety and depression. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's both pre and post. So there's a, there's, we know that people with concussion can develop anxiety and depression. Now, is this a direct result 
of the physiological trauma or mm-hmm. is this the result of the injury itself meaning from a an iatrogenic perspective like telling somebody and was what we used to do telling people that they would sit in a dark room not do anything not talk yeah. to their friends not go on their phones not go to school etc you know does is that creating anxiety is that creating depression is that doing you know the harm that is creating a lot of these a lot of these you know mental health conditions or is it the physiological perspective is it the is it the symptoms right if yeah. somebody's got a headache for a long period of time just like with chronic pain they're going to start to think like life is not worth living and there's potentially there's going to be overlay there on the flip side of that we also know that patients that have higher levels of anxiety pre-injury are more likely to present with concussions now are they are they manifesting some of the symptoms of concussions, meaning that maybe they didn't necessarily have a concussion, but because the symptoms are subjective, they're saying, I got hit and I'm starting to feel dizzy. I'm starting, because they tend to be a little bit more hypervigilant. So that's a thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Anxiety mm-hmm. and depression, we know is correlated with prolonged outcomes after concussion. So if you have pre existing anxiety, depression, any psychiatric conditions, and you get a concussion, the outcomes are going to take you longer. Um, so I think there's a, there's a massive you know overlay. I don't think we fully understand you know chicken and egg and and sure, also how sure. much that we're playing into it. One of the things that I notice, and this this can um, you know take this for what it's worth. It's basically just a anecdotal report of my own patients. But what Please, we've yeah. noticed, one of the things we do with our patients, and these patients are not, are basically PCS patients, right? They're coming okay. in you know two, three, four, five years after their injury, right? And they'll come in and we'll, one of the first things you do is do a symptom severity scale. We'll try to find out where they're at, right? What are your main issues? What are you feeling? And, you know, how did you get your concussion? And, you know, what have you been going through and all of these things. And then the first visit, once we kind of rule out those neurological, you know, red flags, do we need further investigation? Most of the time we don't. Okay. Then we just go right into patient education and we just sit them down. Okay. Concussion is a temporary energy deficit. That's it. Your brain is not damaged, right? You don't have any permanent brain damage, okay? Now, post-concussion syndrome can be caused by one of five things, or it can be a combination of one of these five things or many of these five things. It could be all of these five things. Sometimes it's one, sometimes it's three, sometimes it's five, sometimes whatever. Okay. So here's how we're going to tackle each one of those five things, okay? Mm-hmm. Boom, 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 boom. We lay it all out. Here's the game plan. So next week when I see you, we're going to do this. And then if that's cool, then we're going to do this. And if that's cool, we're going to do this. And then we're going to figure out why you're still feeling the way you feel okay yeah yeah, that's it i don't i don't touch anyone the next time i see them (laughs) they come back in a few days later for whatever thing i have lined up for them Mm -hmm. they come in okay let's see how you're doing since i saw you last let's go through your symptom score honestly probably 70 percent of the time you see a dramatic drop in their symptoms from when you Mm -hmm. saw them on day one to day two i am talking like 50 percent drop 50 percent drop So how much of their symptomatology was just due to the fact that they were scared, that no one had ever explained this to them, that all it took was somebody to sit them down and explain that what they were going through is a common, B, understandable, and Mm -hmm. and C, treatable. They go, oh my God, no one's ever told me any of this stuff before. In five years of seeing neurologist after neurologist, Mm -hmm. no one tells Mm -hmm. them this. Mm -hmm. You teach them that stuff. Boom. Symptoms drop in half. All right. Now we're getting somewhere. That's All right? awesome, Before yeah. we even start, we're already getting somewhere. And it just comes down to having the, the understanding of mm. concussion to be able to yeah. relay that. Like it's the confidence of the practitioner. Like how well do you know this information? Can you ask, answer these questions? And do you know what you're talking about? Because if you do, that patient is going to go, holy shit. Okay. No one's ever told me any of this stuff. And yeah. right away. So how much of that, like I say, is fear, mental health, anxiety, just coming out just through education. Yeah. So. Yeah. And I, and I like the, I like the process too. I mean, this is something that I'm sure we, we could debate back and forth and that's outside the context of this conversation, but um, s- sort of the, 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 the clinical reasoning strategy of, you know, right off the bat, we want to see um, what degree of these, this presentation is due to something like maybe fear or uncertainty. Um, your education is going to handle a lot of that before you go and say, I don't touch him. Well, maybe we think there's a cervicogenic component, or in other words, maybe we think there's a, a component of maybe there's some relationship between the neck and, and the, the, the uh, PCS, but we don't want to treat that because when they come back, we want to see, okay, what is this as a standalone treatment going to affect? And then maybe layer by layer, we can sort of, un, you know, you mentioned these five things, we can go after these layer by layer to see what the 
larger um, the larger players are because you know you can have somebody you can have your scale you can have them talking to you but we all know sometimes we do a treatment and we get oh well, that was a much more impact than I thought it was going to be and that mm -hmm. helps the reasoning so I like the idea of the upfront let's cover this and then let's see what we get and then we move on uh, as opposed to okay I'm going to dry needle you I'm going to manipulate your neck I'm going to do this x y give you five things and they come back and they think yeah I'm better and we think well great that's you know we we'll have to play a yeah. bit more guessing game as to why so yeah. I, I like that strategy it's, uh, yeah. yeah or or even yeah. the 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 other way is is sure. you do you do sure. too much on you do too much on one day and then they go yeah. oh I'm so much worse and then yeah. now you're trying trying to figure out which one made them worse and yeah hundred you know, percent like yeah. so it's it's the same, it kind of works both ways and so you know yeah. that's yeah. that's kind of what we do it's like day one is 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 just education and just ruling out any neurological reasons why I would have to refer this patient, right? Can I manage yeah. this patient by myself? Yes. Okay, let's go. Now, the next thing we do is we get them exercising. Let's put them on the treadmill. Let's see how they do and respond to that. Then yeah. the next time. So everything I'm doing for my assessment, it's like that, then the next day I'm doing vestibular, right? I'm not going to yeah. do all of that stuff right up front at once because then, like you say, it's just a, it's just a cluster of a mess trying to figure it out well if you're and if you're poking at symptoms if you poke enough times eventually everything's going to come become pretty darn reactive i mean if you make right. them so dizzy they want to throw up you know maybe that might, yeah. that might skew yeah. your testing a bit you know uh, you know along the, the the topic of there's so much physiology that can change so much physiology that can present you know how important is it in your mind to have a collaborative care model versus a standalone provider um that's really um, how we tend to look at this, right? So we um, try to be very multidisciplinary. Like if you take a look at our advisory board, we have, um, there's myself, there's a sports medicine physician, there's a, um, uh, a pediatrician, there's a naturopathic doctor, there's a mm -hmm. physiotherapist, mm -hmm. there is a neurologist, um, yeah. there is a neurooptometrist. Um, if you take our course, like we have a vestibular PT that teaches the whole vestibular section, we have mm -hmm. the neurooptometrist teaches the vision section, uh, mm -hmm. the naturopath teaches all about gut, gut brain connection, hormones. Um, the neurologist actually talks about sleep and pharmacology and how that might be helpful. So really we mm, try to give mm. our, our clinicians the education to know what everyone else in the space does, how to, how to maybe know if there's something that is, is, you know, a referable condition where it's like, okay, yeah. I'm getting this point now. When do I say, you know what, I'm going to send you to neuro optometry because something, something's not working here. Right. So yeah. for the most part, and this is the beauty of it when you're a PT or a Cairo or even an AT or something, you know, if you're in that rehab space, there's a lot that you can handle. Like a lot of that kind of yeah. fits in your purview. Right. So you got yeah. treadmill yeah. testing, you got education, you have uh, balance and, and, and various exertion testing. You have reaction sure. time testing, you have all this stuff that's going to be administered you know, by you, you can do all this stuff. Then yeah. it's vestibular, it's ocular motor rehab, it's, uh, it's cervicogenic. Mm -hmm. um, you know what I mean? So those things are right within the purview of rehab professionals. So the bulk of this is actually going to be the PTs that are working on this. But a lot of them don't really realize that they go, oh, concussion. Oh, I'm a vestibular PT. So I, I understand. Yeah. Concussion. But it's like vestibular is like, that's one part, right? And yeah, you yeah. may get lucky and, you know, get that better a few times. But, you know, what about the other pieces that kind of go into that? So that's the beauty of, of having that. So the PTs, the chiros, the rehab professionals are going to handle the bulk of that. But having a referral network where you have neurooptometry, where you have psychology, psychiatry, social work, whatever, yeah. kind of some, that mental health professional network yeah. as well. Then yeah. having a network, let's say, of functional medicine or or um, nat naturopathic doctors, they deal a lot yeah. in that gut health, reducing inflammation, changing the diet. That's a huge, huge component of people's persistent symptoms. We're all just so inflamed, right? And you get an mm. inflamed brain and you keep dumping inflammation on it, it's going to feel foggy, uh. fatigued, cognitively slow, all these things. You clean up the diet and all of a sudden people are like, whoa, I have more energy. I'm sleeping better. I feel like 10 times better. And it's just from like reducing that, right? So that's a huge component too. Um, so yeah, we take a very collaborative multidisciplinary approach. And so actually this year, um, nobody really knows this, so I guess I'm leaking it here. Um, Make it. yeah, so, uh, <laughs> but this, this year, what we're doing, so we, we have our kind of our core network and we're still building on that from a PT Cairo rehab professional space. This year, what we're doing is we are actually building a course right now with our naturopathic doctor to bring on functional medicine doctors to now start building out a network 
of functional medicine doctors and naturopathic doctors to coincide with that network. And then we're also bringing on uh, a whole chain of neuro optometrists that will then form the vision therapy side. So we're basically building this network so that if you're in, you know, where, wherever you are in, 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 in uh, Utah, you can have your clinic and then you'll also know the neuro optometrist in town and you'll also have the naturopathic doctor that's also taken the same training. So now you're kind of creating this cohesive network with referrals happening. And like I was telling you earlier, we have this database system that's an EMR system for now communication. So now you can actually refer to those people and it's yeah. one patient, one file. So if you get back yeah. from the neuro optometrist, you can see everything that they've um, done in terms of rehab, everything uh -huh. that they've, they've prescribed, send them over uh -huh. to the naturopathic doctor, you know what they're taking in supplements, you know everything of what's going on and it's all contained in one file. So awesome. That's what we're building out now to try and even be more collaborative. The next phase on that is the mental health piece. So, so kind of bringing in trained psychologists, psychiatrists, that type of thing to be that outlet there. Um, but that's a hot space right now, especially with COVID. So it's like there, these guys are full, right? So it's hard to, yeah. hard to try and carve out space, but that's yeah. the, um, that's the goal is to make it even more multidisciplinary than it is. Yeah, that's really cool. You, you know, we'll, um, I, I think we'll wrap up here a little bit and then we'll, we'll let, um, I want to hear all about the, the resources you have available for people. We'll do some plugs there at the end. One, one quick thing, and I had a question from uh, my audience was, what, what do you feel like the role of fluid electrolytes uh, and then omega-3s, what, what role does that play with concussion and, and, and PCS? What do you think? Um, so, I mean, I mean, when you think about just basic electrolytes, um, mm -hmm. there's, I mean, some of the things like calcium is one of the big things that actually uh, impacts concussion, kind of makes it worse. Mm -hmm. um, magnesium is kind of an opposition to calcium in a way and actually creates a bit of a plug that can block calcium. So having adequate levels of magnesium is important prior to the injury. So if I have anyone who's doing like MMA, football, anything, contact sports, I will make sure they're taking magnesium as a, as a, almost a preliminary kind of, um, I don't want to say prophylactic, but that type of situation where you want to have adequate stores of magnesium before a concussion injury happens. The rest of that is, is, you know, like blood pressure balance and that type of stuff. And then I, that's basically as far as I go with it. Um, in terms of omega threes, that is, you know, it's very potent anti-inflammatory. Um, you know, it's, it's protective for the brain and, 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 and the nervous system. And so, um, I mean, that's a, that's a good thing that you would do, you know, post injury as, as a bit of a help to lower inflammation. There's all sorts of other compounds too. Um, curcumin is another one that's a really potent anti-inflammatory Okay. Um, resveratrol. There's a bunch of different things that are potent anti-inflammatories from a supplemental perspective, mm -hmm. but that's even the next level. You don't even have to go that far. Really what you want to try and do is cut down on the foods you're ingesting that are more inflammatory in nature. So mm -hmm. getting rid of refined sugars, getting rid of refined carbohydrates, focusing more on like good quality fats, fruits and veggies versus anything refined, you know, like fast food out, pop out, like well, you, 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 you guys call it soda, but it's out. Yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah. um, that type of stuff. So I think that's, that's okay. basically just kind of the foundational element. And then on that, you can build up on that. Um, creatine, for example, is, is basically exogenous ATP. So if your ATP mm. levels are low, taking creatine has been found in, in mice at least to be, to be helpful in terms of recovery. So human trials, I think are ongoing, but, um, that's something that there are ongoing trials against creatine yeah, and hydrate yeah. post-concussion. I think so. Yeah, there was some. Wow. There was some. There were, there were some that were started at least. I think it was in California um, that they had trials going on, but I haven't heard anything on it. So okay. I'm not sure if they they abandon it or what. But there were trials going on at one point. I've been waiting to see what happens. But hmm. you know, you know, w one last thing, and I'm, I'm sorry to poke this because I, but I just I get so lost here uh, personally when I when I look at the at the literature when I when I start hearing about you know the inflammatory diets. You know, I certainly think we're having emerging evidence on the the microbiome perspective, gut health, and and I think there's a, there's a lot to be to, to, a lot to be discovered there. But I, I always get lost when I hear about the the anti-inflammatory diets because I, I just feel like I can't I can't go to the research and, and discover much. I mean I, I I'm absolutely you know empathetic towards dietitians and their evidence. It's so hard to study you know what happens when something goes into the body and every single piece of physiology that happens. Do you find is there any evidence you can point to that, that's actually shown a good uh, maybe a, a randomized trial or something that's shown something about the anti-inflammatory diet contributing to longer term or shorter term symptoms after concussion, anything you can point me to? Cause I, I just get a little lost and it's hard to track. It's hard to follow yeah, that line. Of I mean, I mean, you have to, you have to really, um, 
when it's when it's looking at specifically for concussion, you're not really going to find a bunch, right? Like that's that's kind of one of the things that we we definitely don't make any bones about is that when you're looking mm-hmm. at it specifically for concussion injuries, it's it's hard mm-hmm. to find stuff. There's there's mm-hmm. stuff on um, you know it's mostly pro-inflammatory foods. Um, there's a lot okay. of you know trials on mice, for example. Mm-hmm. There's there's um, there was a recent like really long review paper looking at how the Western diet alone can be promoting uh, in inflammation and post concussion um, okay. there's studies there's early studies looking at ketogenic for example that's another kind of area that that might be interesting mm. um so and i mean really like we cover this there's probably about four hours of lecture in our course just on just on this like we have a lot wow. of evidence that brain injury actually uh increases permeability of the gut lining so that you get kind of this leaky gut situation going on where foods that are pro-inflammatory will actually increase more in inflammation systemically. Uh, mm-hmm. That's leading to something called um, post-inflammatory, post-inflammatory brain syndrome, which is kind of the same idea when you have a lot of systemic inflammation that's happening. And so mm-hmm. basically brain injury impairs gut lining and permeability. Then you're going to get more you know, systemic inflammation, more immunological response. Uh, your gut is where a lot of neurotransmitters are produced. And so that can affect your neurotransmitter production. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of evidence now suggesting that even depression and anxiety are actually gut and inflammatory conditions, um, mm-hmm. not necessarily brain biochemistry ne- like just that. But there's mm-hmm. a lot now looking at how the gut influences overall health and well-being because of the production of uh, serotonin, with the production of GABA, with the production of all of these things. Um, mm-hmm. So I think when you really start diving into it, you know that the foods that we eat will increase systemic inflammation. We know that brain injury will. So you know what I mean. So you're drawing the lines before you necessarily have really good evidence-based protocols. Like mm-hmm. we know that you know x co- x equals y y equals z and you know so now we can conceivably say that x will probably equal z as well um mm-hmm. and so that's kind of how we how we kind of set it up and so we, okay. we, we more encourage whole diets that just avoid the sugar and the crap um and sure which is a very reasonable suggestion right i mean it's Honestly, you know it's, put a bunch of good food in your body and then it, and, and i guess that makes it even harder for me so i'm thinking well i'm looking at this diet that's um a either pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory diet and maybe they're doing things with with dairy but also they're just eating really good foods so then my right. thought as well so so if they just eat really good foods does that capture the purpose or do they have to go the extra mile maybe and i don't know if I don't, I'm just making this up. I don't know much about it. Dairy, and maybe we're saying dairy is a, an inflammatory component. Um, if we have a trial, we could look at, well, let's put dairy into both really good quality diets and see what happens with the control group. Uh, but yeah, it just looks like people are just making really smart decisions with their food. They're not having Doritos. They're having some whole foods. And it's like, yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to get behind that pretty easily, you know? Well, I think that's, and that's the idea, right? This is really how yeah. we should all, we should all be eating anyway. Um, yeah. Like the yeah. whole idea behind functional medicine is to reduce systemic inflammation. I mean, cancers, mm-hmm. heart disease, diabetes, all of this stuff is, they're now considered to be chronic inflammatory conditions based on the diets that we're eating. And so if that level of inflammation is contributing to these types of issues and this chronic inflammatory condition, fatty livers and everything else, trying to go the opposite way is going to be beneficial for your health and actually will probably make you feel more clear. And I've done this personally with myself too. Like I've, I've, I've messed around with, you know, intermittent fasting and things like that and, and switching to um, like, I've been eating somewhat mostly keto for the past little bit um, like past six weeks or so. And you just feel clear. Like, you know what I mean? Like I just, I would, I would, you know, walk out to my car and just be like, Whoa, like I feel like I have a leg up on everyone else because I'm just so, clear i'm not like sluggish and slow and then when you have like a, a pasta dinner you're just like oh, like you're ready to fall asleep right and if mm-hmm. anyone's had a big meal you will you will feel that way but if you start cleaning it up and going okay i'm gonna eat lighter salads you know a little bit healthier you'll probably start to notice a difference in that and if you're a concussion patient you're dealing with all these symptoms and you start eating like that you'll probably start to have the same effect and go oh my god like i'm feeling so clear i'm feeling like my headaches are down mm-hmm. um you know mm-hmm. so I think there's, I think there's definitely something to it. Um, whether or not we have specific evidence on this yeah. type of diet for concussion, it's not sure. there yet, but we have enough sure, evidence sure. now for other conditions. We have enough evidence, even on the mice that I think it's not going to hurt you. If anything, it's going to help you in many other ways yeah. and yeah. Uh, it may help your concussion symptoms. So let's go.
Right, and then my la and I guess just for my own reading, so I can go out and reference this. Um, when you mentioned, you know, you mentioned things like cancer and, and the, the they're now thought to be, you know, things about systemic inflammation. Can you give me a resource? What what uh, what author groups or what uh, organizations are are pointing to things like cancer as as um, you know systemic inflammation? Where can I find more information on that for my own reading? I would, I would, I would just go through PubMed and see what you can find. Um, I don't have any authors specifically that I, I was actually doing a lot of research last week. I did a podcast with Daniel Carcillo, um, who's an NHL player, a former NHL player, but he's, he's just started a company now on psilocybin, which is magic mushrooms for the treatment of persistent concussion symptoms. And so I was diving into mm -hmm. the research on psilocybin. Um, mm -hmm. And even that was mentioning, and that was, that was kind of, you know, that was kind of sidebar research, but it, even that was mentioning, you know, the potent anti-inflammatory effect of psilocybin mushrooms and how depression and anxiety are linked with inflammatory conditions and things like that. So, so mm -hmm. it's, it's definitely out there. And I think that if okay. you do a little bit of digging, you, I don't think you'll have any trouble finding, finding okay. That, okay. that idea. Um, okay. But yeah, awesome. it's, uh, it's interesting. And then my, I apologize. I took you too 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 long. Can you please? Um, you, I, I'm I'm such a fan of the fact that you have done, created a data capture system where we can get information on a very large scale for individuals. Uh, data is really going to help us all grow in our in our own knowledge base, pre and post screening data, all that kind of stuff. Could you just plug away all the resources that you built? Feel free to just drop those in now and and help uh, help our audiences know where to find all this good information. Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, we were just talking before the show. That's, uh, that's yeah. why I was bringing it up. But um, yeah. um, we, so part of complete concussion management, one of the things I wanted was not only, um, you know, centers where people could go and they would get an evidence-based approach where that, that no matter which clinic they went to, they would have a kind of a systematized approach that's evidence-based where if you got tested here, but you got injured here, you could, you know, you could make it work because they're using the same equipment. And we were going to do this where people would have kind of like a, a paper copy of their test results. And so we decided to say, you know what, let's put it all digital. And so we combined everything digital. So we made our own EMR system um, specifically for concussion. So it has all your treadmill testing on there, has all your exertional testing on there, has all your vestibular testing on there, has all your baseline testing on there. Um, and it communicates with a smartphone app so that patients have access to it. Coaches can report injuries from the sidelines and send those injuries in. And what we did on that is we made it so that it could really capture kind of data points because the other piece of this coming from a research perspective, the research was crap, right? Basically all the research that we have on concussion is that, you know, you take the university football team, you know, you have, you test 50 guys, you know, and out of the season, maybe five of them get concussed and there's your sample. You got a sample size of five. Well, that's no good, right? Like you're, it's going to take us years to be able to figure out anything that's going on here with such small samples. And so mm -hmm. one of the things I really wanted to do was to be able to use this for research. And so we basically created a de-identified database so that, and that was mostly for privacy so that we couldn't even get into it and know anybody who anybody is. But now what we can do is we can basically ask this thing any question. So we partner, so now it's probably the largest concussion database in the world. We've partnered with several universities and have done all sorts of different studies. There's probably 10 or 15 studies that have been done using our database now because you can basically ask it any question. And these are some of the largest sample sizes in the world. So you can get in there and go, all right, show me 15 to 17 year old females that are on birth control versus those that are not on birth control. Mm -hmm. What are their baselines look? What are their symptom scores look like? You know, mm -hmm. is there anything here protective? What's their recovery time look like? What's the average time to symptom free? What's the average time to return to play the average time? You know, yeah, you can yeah. drill down into anything you want to look at. Show me kids between seven and nine years old that have ADHD. Show me like it's, it's insane. Mm -hmm. Wow. kind of what you can do. And that's yeah. really, I think the key, because now what we're getting into is even for our clinicians, getting into things like predictive algorithms and knowing when somebody's trying to, you know, skirt a baseline or sandbag a baseline test, kind of be able to pick it up being like, this is an invalid result, you know, mm. so you already know, or mm. somebody comes in and they present with these symptoms after a motor vehicle accident, they had a loss of consciousness, they had post-traumatic amnesia for this long, here's their symptom severity score, they've had three previous concussions. And the system tells us, this person is likely to recover on December 9th. It's likely going to take them four visits to get better. And the treatments that are probably going to be the most effective are going to be these ones, right? Because you, yeah, you have yeah. such a large data that you're creating kind yeah. of this ma machine learning system that can inform clinical decision-making. Uh, and then if that isn't true, 
it refines the algorithm and then it gets better for the next person, right? Because when you have, you know, 50,000 patients coming through this, it's just, it's just going, right? So yeah, that's, yeah. it's a really, really robust uh, thing. So I'm pretty proud of it. You should <laughs> be, that's incredible. That really that, is very the cool. The fact that we did that. Um, yeah, very cool, and, very cool. And it, was, and it all started just to be able to, you know, have data transfer easily from a baseline testing perspective. And now it's transformed into whole concussion management side of things. And, you know, even informing insurance, think about, you know, how valuable it is to an insurance provider saying, okay, how much is going to cost me? Oh yeah. yeah. Here you go. Yeah. This is, the, this is the estimated cost based on this. Like think about this even from a personal injury perspective, right? Yeah. They're trying to sue for damages on an injury that happened. Okay. Let's run them through our system. Yeah. Here's the, esti- here's the estimated treatment cost, yeah. you know, based yeah. on actual data. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, that'll help you with settlement claims. It'll ha- help you with insurance costs. It'll help you with a whole bunch of different things. Um, so it's, it's a yeah. pretty cool thing. It's pretty cool. Very too. cool. Very cool. Uh, any other patient um, or, per, you know, resources individuals can learn more about concussion. Uh, you, you have a lot of, you know, I think you have some information about self screens, things like that. Uh, any other resources you want to give websites or anything else? Uh, if you are a clinician and you're looking to get trained, uh, you can go to completeconcussions.com. And if you click on, there's a button at the top bar that says clinic certification. Uh, you can see there, basically it starts with taking our course uh, and then you kind of join our membership program and that we give you ongoing evidence updates and things like that to kind of keep you up to date. Um, so completeconcussions.com is that. Um, myself personally, um, I also have a kind of a patient course that we've created so that patients can just kind of start working through some of the stuff on their own, right? Like rather than coming into the clinic, here's, you know, here's how you eat, here's how you start exercising, here's how you do that. Um, and that's actually called the concussion fix program. Um, and that one is at concussiondoc.io. So we're kind of merging those two together at some point, but we haven't yet. Um, but yeah, that's it. You can see me on Instagram at concussion underscore doc and, uh, complete concussions is at complete concussions. Cool, man. Uh, thanks again. It's been a blast chatting with you. This was, this was a fun learning experience for me, and I know our audiences are going are gonna to learn from it. So uh, it really, great. really great time chatting with you, man. Yeah, it was awesome. Yeah. You have a great day. Thanks. Yeah, you too. Cheers.